Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining us for today's lecture, and it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers for today. Dr. Ginger Pedersen is a college administrator and history researcher. She received her master's degree in psychology and her doctoral degree in higher education administration from Florida Atlantic University. A native Floridian, Dr. Pedersen has always been intrigued by Florida's history, particularly Palm Beach County. Her earliest Florida ancestor arrived in 1886. She maintains two local history websites and serves on a historic resources preservation board. Dr. Pedersen has given speeches on various historical subjects to local audiences. Pioneering Palm Beach is her first book. Janet DeVries is a resident of Palm Beach County and has been living here since 1987. She is an archivist and historian and is a librarian at the Palm Beach State College. Janet graduated from Palm Beach State College and will graduate in May with a Bachelor of Arts degree in history from Florida Atlantic University. She is the author of four books, including Around Boynton Beach, 2006, Sports Fishing in Palm Beach County in 2008. Janet is vice president of the Boynton Beach Historical Society and is a member of many local and national historical, library, and genealogical societies. Her roots in Florida go deep. Her paternal grandfather, Fred Gardner, was a real estate agent and property appraiser in South Florida in the 1930s. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ginger Pedersen and Janet DeVries. Good afternoon and thank you for coming out today. We have a wonderful journey for you that started very innocently and was simply started with a question, a very simple question. And that question was, I'm a resident of Boynton Beach and I wanted to know where this hotel was that you see on the screen. This is the Boynton Beach Hotel that was somewhere on the beach in Boynton but nobody was quite sure where it was. So I thought, I'll figure out where it is. I'll just go to the courthouse and look at the records. <laughs> so the, the records for the land records for Palm Beach County are located on the fourth floor of the courthouse. The plat books are enormous. They're probably about this large by about this wide and they weigh at least 35 pounds. So we got them, pulled them down. They were really dusty, blew off the dust and then turned the page. And when we looked at the page for what was the area of Boynton Beach, we kept seeing one name over and over again, and that name was Bertie Dewey. So I'm like, Bertie Dewey? Wait a minute. I, the story I'd always been told was that Major Boynton founded the town of Boynton. So I thought, why is this woman named, of all things, Bertie Dewey, selling all the lots downtown? So we did what anybody else did. What would you do when you want to find something? We Googled her. <laughs> And we Googled her and we came up with this, the Lake Worth Pioneer Association website, which mentioned her and her husband, who was named Frederick Sidney Dewey. It also gave us another important clue, and that was Mrs. Dewey's full name, which was Bird Spillman Dewey, with a rather unusual spelling. So what did we do again? Whoops. We Googled her. Whoops, what do you got, fish? <laughs> I don't know what that is. That's not her. That's Nemo. Yeah, look at for Nemo. Let's get this restarted. Ah, there we are. So, who was Bertie Dewey? So, one of the items that we came across was a Who's Who directory, and that was from 1901. And in her Who's Who entry, it was full of all of the basic information for Mrs. Dewey. We were able to find out that she was an author. We found out something very interesting, that she was a grandniece of Zachary Taylor. Her husband's name, Frederick Sidney Dewey. That she wrote a book called Bruno. She wrote other items under pen names. And most interestingly, that she lived someplace called Ben Travato. So with all, those, with all those wonderful clues, 
we thought, this is a bigger story than we're thinking here. So I, I sent uh, Janet an email, and she wrote me back. She says, you feel we're on to something? And I said, yes, we were definitely on to something. So in order to find out more information about this intriguing subject, we had to do research. So we were able to um, start our research at a very special place, which was the Historical Society of Palm Beach County. So we can kind of say that this book was actually born here in the archives. But I also made contact with different people throughout the state of Florida and in the country. We talked to genealogists, we talked to historical societies, we talked to librarians. We went to Jacksonville, we went to Miami, we went to Orlando, and then it was getting so intriguing that I even took hopped on a plane and went to the National Archives in Washington, D.C. to do some more research. Um, we, because these were famous families, we were, were dealing with the Taylors, um, the Taylor family, and we were dealing with the Dewey family. A lot of the research was already done for us, so we knew we were able to follow the trail of work that other people had done. Bird Spielman Dewey was indeed the grandniece of Zachary Taylor. This is the father of Zachary Taylor, Colonel Richard Taylor. So this goes deep into the roots of American history, very much so. Another important person was Judge Earl Hoover to our research in a strange way. Judge Hoover was a judge from Cleveland, Ohio, and he was very intrigued with Bird, Spil Bil Bird Dewey's father, who was the Reverend Dewey or the, Re I'm sorry, the Reverend Spillman. And so in the 1960s, he did some extensive research and he came down to Palm Beach County. This is a picture of Jonathan Edward Spillman. He wrote one of the most famous songs of the 19th century, which some of you may know, Flow Gently, Sweet Afton. And his was a very published, it was published in every standard American songbook. His total payment for writing that song was 12 copies of the sheet music. That's all he received in royalties at that time, so it wasn't a lot of good payment. This is uh, the only known picture of Bird Spillman Dewey and her family, and what you have on the end, you have uh, the little Julia Bird Spillman, which was her name that she was born under, sitting by her mother. Her mother was Eliza Sarah Taylor, and that was her maiden name. You see the rest of the Spillman children, one child is not yet born in that picture. And on the end, you see Reverend Spillman, who actually started out his career as an attorney in Kentucky. So they were raised in Maysville. Most of the children were born there as well. Um, when you do research, not everything you find is happy. And that's one of the kind of sad parts of this. Uh, I had seen in some of the genealogical records that uh, Bertie's mother had died when she was only 10. And I didn't give it much thought. I thought there's so much disease at the time, things happen. And reading further into the history, I found a biography of one of her brothers, and in it, it mentioned how her mother had indeed passed away. This is the steamboat, the Bostona. At the time, the family was living in Maysville, and her mother was to go upstream, or downstream, depending on which way, on the Ohio River to Cincinnati to visit her older son, her oldest child. Um, as this ship was pulling away from the docks, the family had waved goodbye. They had run back to the house. The house looked over the river. It was a very hot August evening, just at sunset. And there was some sheep on board. They kicked the lantern over, an oil lantern. It hit the wood on, that was being uh, transported on the ship, and the ship immediately burst into flames. The ship was just pulling away from the dock, so the captain of uh, the ship just kind of rammed it into a sandbar that was nearby so that people could get off. Mrs. Spillman tried to run down the deck, and it just at that moment, a steam pipe burst and sprayed her with scalding water. She was thrown into a boat, and she somehow managed to crawl back up to her house up the hill. She died two days later, leaving behind six children. So, the only time, and, and if you've read, I think a couple of you out there have read Mrs. Uh, Dewey's book, Bruno, which we have a copy here. Uh, she only mentioned it once, and I didn't catch it upon a first reading, but I realized later when I knew the backstory what this quote was. A fire fills me with horror, especially if it breaks out in the night. It always reminds me of the burning of a big steamer, 
that happened one awful night in my 10th year. This is the only time she mentions it uh, in her writings. And so, of course, if you didn't know the backstory, you would just read that and think, well, this is just something that must have happened when she was a child. So in the 1960s, Judge Hoover came to Palm Beach County and he performed research. He started to become intrigued with bird dewey and wanted to find out more information for her. So it was chronicled in the local newspaper that the visiting judge was seeking information and people sent letters to him back giving information. And those letters are chronicled in the archives at the Historical Society of Palm Beach County. There's a 12-page meticulous report, and that was able to aid us in our research and to find more of the clues to find out who Bird Dewey was and also her father, Jonathan Spillman. Yes, Judge Hoover stayed at the Blossom residence. He was a well-known Cleveland historian, has written, had written a lot about the history of, of Cleveland. And we have Fred Dewey's Civil War records. Right. Um, most of these records are available on a website called Fold3, which is another genealogical and ancestry website. Um, Mr. Dewey was in the Civil War, and he enlisted in 1862 in Missouri. He was promoted to Sergeant Major, and then, sadly, he contacted tuberculosis. This is a copy of uh, Fred's discharge record as he was discharged from the Army. And you can see here, he was discharged because he was not expected to live. Tuberculosis and other diseases killed more soldiers in the Civil War than the fighting ever did. Uh, he was even too sick, what was called the Invalid Corps. He was even too ill for that. Even though by trade he was an accountant and bookkeeper, uh, he was too ill to serve in that capacity. So he was discharged from the Army. So this is Salem, Illinois, back in 1877. Bertie was probably living home with her parents, and Fred was working at a bank in Salem. Her father was minister of the Presbyterian Church, and that was the same Presbyterian Church where William Jennings Bryan worshipped. And um, the ceremony, when they were married in 1877, was performed by her father, Jonathan Spillman. Now, because of Fred's health, there was the uh, way of the time that everybody said, hey, go to Florida for your health, right? Come to the warmth if you have respiratory problems. So the Deweys had heard a lot of glowing reports from their friends about how wonderful life was in Florida. So she calls it Begin to Talk Florida. And this would be a typical scene of the time on the St. John's River. So they ventured southward into the wilds of that, what was that time uh, central Florida. Now, we knew from her book, Bruno, which actually turns out to be pretty much an autobiography of their first years in Florida. We knew from this book that she talks about going to a place called Lemonville. That really stumped us for a long time because there is no city in Florida named Lemonville. And even on old maps, new maps, we could never find a Lemonville. So the other thing that she mentions in her book is that she had a relative living in a nearby town. So that was another mystery that we had to solve. We saw a town called Mellonville. We thought, well, maybe that's a clue as to what it is. So we began to research the land history records of Orange County in Orlando. And we also read history books of the Orlando region. We found this fine looking gentleman. His name is R.G. Robinson. And when we saw in the history book written about Orange County, it said he was a grand nephew of Zachary Taylor. So now we finally had the connection. He co-founded a town called Zellwood, which is a tiny little place that still exists to this day. And it was there that the Deweys found their first Florida homestead. In fact, this is one of the land records where they bought 10 acres of land in Zellwood and R.G. Robinson, her, her cousin, was one of the signers, the witnesses on the deal for this 10 acres of land because they were going to grow oranges and make a lot of money as they had the orange fever, the orange dream of having that uh, gentleman's life in the country on your orange estate. They ended up buying 10 more acres of land as well. 
This is a little glimpse into um, Mrs. Dewey's book, Bruno, and in it she gives a little glimpse of what it was like to live in Florida in the 1880s. You had foods that none of us are accustomed to. One of the things that they would eat, not really by choice, was alligator. So this is the way that she described um, their first adventure, eating alligator. When cooked, it was very inviting, being a compromise between fish and the white meat of domestic fowls. So but what does alligator taste like? Chicken. Maybe perhaps Mrs. Dewey was the first writer to make that wonderful analogy that alligator tastes just like chicken. So the orange grove. They sat with their 20 acres. Nobody told them it takes five to seven years to get your orange trees big enough to actually make some money. They had thought, we'll grow vegetables on the land. Didn't work out. She said that the, all the vegetables they grew the first year would fit in a two-cup measure. So this didn't work out. So Mr. Dewey had an offer from a nearby person that she calls Mr. Hawk, said, come to my town, the big town nearby, and you can be my bookkeeper and my accountant in my store. So then we had another clue. She also said, we went to this town called Lemonville and we bought two town lots. Well, when she said that and we pulled the land record, two town lots was in Eustis. So we found that Eustis, Florida, was indeed Lemonville. So of course we had to go to Eustis. Now if you don't know where Zellwood is or Eustis is, um, you probably know where Mount Dora is. So if, if you're going up to Mount Dora, you usually go right through Zellwood and if you blink, you're going to miss it. It's, it's still there, but it's a really little town. Eustis is just a little bit bigger. So um, before we went, we talked to the people at the Historical Society, and we talked to the library. We made an appointment. We went up there. So we're um, driving down the street, and um, we're about to go to the library, and all of a sudden, we see a sign. We see, we see Dewey Street. <laughs> and uh, Dewey Street was indeed named for the Deweys. We met with the town historian and went over old plat maps. And indeed, this is where their house was located. And because they were the first pioneer on that street, they were allowed to name the street after themselves as the town of Dewey was platted by, or the town of Dewey, the town of uh, Eustace was platted by Mr. Dewey's boss. So that was a mystery that the town did not know about. It was published there in the local newspaper, so the mystery of how Dewey Street was named was solved. More unhappiness that you can find in these things. In her book, Bruno, she speaks very painfully of when their first child was born, and she does not name this child by name. She simply calls her Little Blossom. She talks about Little Blossom is not really growing very well, and they went to the seashore so that Little Blossom could have more fresh air. But infant mortality rates were extremely high in those times, and Little Blossom died. It's a very gripping tale of losing a child. She uses this iteration, it is night in a long white draped room, and how the pink of the shade kind of makes you think that the baby could be still alive. It was very, very, I mean, I, I had tears rolling down my face when I read it, and I thought, how are we going to find, is this really true? I mean, everything in the book is checked out, land records, dates, relations. Why would she have put something in the book so gripping if it weren't true? So we searched for, I would say, about eight months for Little Blossom. And I had noticed in a um, death listing that Mrs. Dewey's brother, William Spillman, looked like he could be buried in Jacksonville. It said W.M. Spillman was buried in this one cemetery. So I called. I said, the W.M. Spillman, is that William McGill? I called to the cemetery, and the woman said, yes. She said, I'm looking here in the registry. She says, but you know, Buried next to William McGill Spillman is an Elizabeth Dewey. I said, ah, uh, she said, it's just 1885 is the only date. And I said, I have found Little Blossom. So her name was Elizabeth Dewey. We actually went to the Jacksonville Cemetery, and it's odd because cemeteries typically have an infant section. So in the middle of the infant section sits Mrs. Dewey's brother. I think she had him buried next to where her baby had been buried. So that was another amazing finding that we could prove once again that Bruno, the book, is really autobiographical. Okay, now the part that is getting close to where we're living today. In 1877, the Deweys bought 76 acres of land on Lake Mangonia. 
when she writes about the land, she is very poetic and beautiful, and she says it was a land fanned by spice-laden breezes. You have to think, uh, Dade County at that time was much, much uh, larger than it is today. Dade County of 1890 stretched all the way from basically where St. Lucie is all the way down through Miami. So this was a very large Dade County. And we can kind of zoom in a little bit and you see some towns there. Lake Worth, you see the odd town of Palm City, which is an early name for Palm Beach that was rejected by the post office. And they said, you already, Palm City is already taken. You have to call it something else. And they said, hey, let's call it Palm Beach. Something strange called Figulus, which is actually an estate that was the Potter Estate and later the Bingham Blossom Estate. And uh, really nothing else there except a lot of swamp. So they filed the, the plat in their homestead in Gainesville, and they paid $1.25 an acre for the land in 1887. So this is their homestead affidavit. And um, it goes on to show what they grew. They grew um, various tropical plants. They grew lemons and guavas. And they also raised chickens. <laughs> yes, this is a view. If you were standing at City Place today, and you were doing that, you were suddenly transported back in time, this is what you would see. That little dirt road is Sapadilla. OK, and so Mrs. Dewey is sitting in this wooded area, a little bit north of there. This was actually the populated part, in this tiny little home. And this is another one of her quotes. She was all by herself. The nearest person was two miles away. But there was really almost no women at all living on the west side of Lake Worth. She said she never saw a woman's face except for the reflection of my own when, for very loneliness, I carried my sewing to sit before the dressing table where I could lift my eyes and play that the reflected image was a busy companion. Wow. Think about that. That's how lonely she was living in that tiny house. Mrs. Dewey wrote a number of um, books and she also wrote articles. There was an elusive reference that we found and it was something called From Pine Woods to Palm Beach. We didn't know what it was. Oh, I'm sorry, From Pine Woods to Palm Groves. I read that incorrectly. And we didn't know what it was um, and we kept searching for it. We kept searching for it and finally we found that the only copy existed was in Jacksonville. So I went up to Jacksonville and didn't know what to expect. The librarian had put some books called the Florida Review on a cart, and they were the year-long, um, it was a whole year of magazines that were bound into one. And when I started looking through it, I found not one, not two, but eight chapters of lost stories that only exist in one format and one library. We're actually hoping to get these republished because this tells the story of their time in Palm Beach, chronicled from a woman's point of view. This is a page from that publication. It is a lovely story. Uh, it was written in 1909, and so it was written in the contemporary time in this kind of obscure journal. And it really is a lovely story of how it, difficult it was to live at that time. Now, uh, the Hermitage was an interesting place. This is Lake Mangonia. You see that peninsula of land no longer exists. That's all been filled in. That's basically Australian Avenue, if you know where that is, going along uh, Lake Mangonia. So they got these two government lots that were 76 acres. And on it, you had to actually, in your homestead claim, say what you did on the land. They grew some pineapples and some guavas and something called an alligator pear. Does anybody know what an alligator pear is? An avocado, correct. So at your next luncheon, say you're serving avocado, uh, you know, you're serving alligator pears, and your guests will be like, oh my, what, what is that? So uh, it is an interesting, it even gives details on the size of their home, which was 22 feet by 25 feet. It's a little cottage. They had windows. And uh, it was a cute little place out there tucked in the woods. This is more information about that. They had t cleared two acres and were actually doing some, they're not raising crops, but they had some tropical fruits growing at the place. This is the Hermitage. You have that. The Hermitage, uh, it's actually not, this little building is the incinerator. 
The land was later sold to West Palm Beach and 10 acres of it became uh, the city dump. But if you look carefully, tucked in the woods is a little cottage. That we believe pretty definitively was the Dewey home that was just accidentally caught on the other photograph. So it was a tiny little place under the sand pines or the spruce pines as they called them at that time. So Fred Dewey was an educated man. One of the things that he did was he worked as a bookkeeper. He knew how to keep books, um, do some accounting. So he worked for one of many places where he worked was the UD Hendrickson store. He also was the Jupiter quarantine officer and he also was one of the earliest county commissioners for Palm Beach, what was then Dade County. All right, th this is the title of a very intriguing work that we could not find. You know, you're looking for all these things, you're Googling them, and you know, you're feeling kind of silly. It's like, who seeks finds? Well, if we knew it, we would find it when we find it. So we finally went back into the archive of the Historical Society of Palm Beach County, and um, we looked through the files again, really patiently this time, because sometimes when you're excited about research, you can miss something. So we literally went through with a fine tooth comb. First we looked at all the photographs, then we looked again at the folder, and we see this really tiny pamphlet. It's hand sewn, and the name of it is called Who Seeks Finds? But we wondered, why didn't we find it anyplace else? So, um, in the inside of it, it said it was republished by the permission of the Century Company, and I said, wait a minute, if this has been published, why didn't I find it? I mean, I went through all my sources. This is very odd. So it was about literally 11 o'clock that night, and I thought there could be one reason why I didn't find it. So quickly again in Google, I put in the keywords to the story. It's a little fairy tale about a queen and flower. So I Googled those terms, and what do I find? This, who seeks finds, it was published. So why didn't I find it? It was published under a pen name, Judith Bray. So this was finally, and it was nine months of searching to think, how do you find someone's pen name unless it's documented somewhere, which it had not been. So we got all excited and we're like, yay, we found her pen name. So I went through all the old archives of magazines and books, Google Books, other uh, archives in Cornell. Didn't find any other publications, magazine articles, anything about under a Judith Ray. So I thought, oh my goodness, another dead end. So instead, I just said, let me search for women named Judith. In her story, Bruno, she is always the character of Judith, and her husband is the character of Julius. So I thought, well, she's obviously somehow connected to this name, Judith. So I find all kinds of articles under someone else. This time, it's Judith Sunshine. And Judith Sunshine was her main pen name that she used in her articles in Good Housekeeping, uh, in the Christian Union, in the Ladies' Home Journal, all kinds of publications that she did under that name of Judith Sunshine. This particular article is a absolute detailed description of all the furniture that she, her and her husband built for the tiny cottage. He did all the carpentry and she did all of the uh, upholstery work and she tells people how you can do the same thing. She's kind of the Frank Lloyd Wright of her time in having built-in furniture. And she gives details of how you can make this furniture look nice and oil your floors. So it's, it's just a fascinating glimpse into a different time. Okay, so after a while, the little homestead that they had along Lake Mangonia was feeling quite isolated. Bertie had contact with the Seminole Indians that were, you know, knocking on the door to trade. She was a little bit frightened at first because, you know, sometimes they would talk about them being savages, but everything worked out. So eventually they started to look for some land a little bit further south. And they, um, Ben Lanehart was auctioning off his land. So in 1890, they bought five acres and the land stretched from Lake Worth, the body of water, all the way to where Dixie Highway is today. Now, this is Ben Travato. Ben Travato 
was the name of their home. It was the common thing, and it still is in Palm Beach, to give a name to your house. Any, anybody speak Italian? Nobody, at our, one of our lectures we had someone. Ben Trovato in Italian means well invented. So her home was well invented, and this is a close up shot. And if you look carefully, we think that's her and her husband sitting on the front porch. Now the home faced the water. It faced Lake Worth, or what we call today the Intracoastal Waterway. Because in the back of your house was nothing but woods. Why would you put the front door that way? So the front porch, this is actually the front porch of Ben Travato. Very lovely home. So the area was starting to develop and in what is now Palm Beach and in West Palm Beach, before it was West Palm Beach, someone started a newspaper. So that person was Guy Metcalf. He started the area's first newspaper. It was called The Tropical Sun. And Bertie was a regular columnist for The Tropical Sun. She wrote under the name of Aunt Judith. Now this is actually something we discovered after the book was published because we didn't pick up on the Aunt Judith connection to these articles. Her series was called The Sitting Room and it gave advice, recipes. I, I love this one. It's like banana pie, baked bananas, and fried bananas. So every recipe is guavas, bananas, avocados, all of the things that the locals could actually obtain very easily. So it's kind of whimsical. She does a little bit of essays and a couple, a little bit of writing. Um, she, she lectures women on don't do too much housework once in a while. She gives short, shortcuts of how to do things for your house. So it's really kind of a nice glimpse into uh, life at that time with women in Pioneer. She did have to apologize once. She included a recipe that called for wine. This was the time of the Women's Christian Temperance Union. And so she said it was an oversight for which she takes all of the blame. So she asked, do not send in any more recipes with wine in them. Finally, we get a glimpse of Mrs. Dewey. As you can see, not only was she a, a dog fan, as her, her book Bruno, the main character is her dog, uh, we get into a glimpse that she's also a fan of cats. And cats were the main subject of her second book, which is entitled The Blessed Isle. The Blessed Isle was the entire name of the estate. This book was published in 1907 in uh, St. Augustine. And you can occasionally find copies, like we got these copies through eBay and through uh, uh, other uh, antique booksellers. Uh, and they're lovely stories and, and vignettes of her cats, which is interesting. You think, how can you write a book? I call it cat soap opera. You almost have to draw a diagram because there's so much going on with all of these various cats. I mean, she doesn't have one or two, she has like 10. So she has all names and how they relate. It's, it's quite, quite humorous stories about cats. So Fred was elected, <clears throat> excuse me, as the Dade County tax collector, tax assessor in 1890. So he would take this boat and it was called the Heron, actually they call it a Sharpie, and travel all the way through Dade County on this boat. The trip would take a month, and that would be carrying the big books, the, the books where they would actually record who owned what property and how much they were going to assess it for taxes. So there was two books, one, one to keep and one to deliver to the courthouse. But um, this was a party that he took along on, on one of the trips, the trip in 1890. And um, the Gilpins were along on this trip and we were able to find much of the information from the Gilpins diary at this Historical Society of Palm Beach County archives as well as in History Miami. Yes, we have this, this cute little quote here where she talks about her. The entire staff of the tax assessor and collector's office was two people, Fred Dewey and his wife. And they had to take that one book, which was huge, and make two identical copies of it. And so they would you know, have to be, make this perfect. And uh, she said, it doesn't take a brilliant mathematician. She is, you know, belongs to that grand army of women of which I belong to, who has to make change on your fingers and toes. Uh, to do these books. So imagine all the hundreds of people and millions of dollars that are involved in just collecting and assessing taxes today in the three counties that now exist here instead of the one huge county of Dade. Now, this is Ben Travato at a 1893 party. A beautiful shot. 
And we sometimes think that their world was just black and white, that everything was gray tone, but it really was not. There was color to their world. And through uh, some magic that will develop slowly here, you will see a little bit of color develop in this world. And it is the lovely costumes. I worked with a restorer on this, and he said pretty much he can tell by the tone of the grays what colors the women actually wore at that time. They did not just wear black and white, and I have a close-up of that here. So you get an idea of some of the lovely costumes and the lovely home that existed. So the next question that we had was, where was this house? This is a 1907 map done by George Curry, and um, it shows the Dewey House down there on the south end next to the Kinzels, which was a German professor and his wife. Um, we wanted to ma match it up to what is there today, so we had to do a little bit of magic with the maps as well. These are actually two maps. One of them is a, what's called a Sanborn map, and below that is a modern view. And from this, we were able to line up the streets and realize that the house is, sits on the back parking lot or would have sat on the back parking lot of the Rapallo condominium. The people in the Rapallo didn't know this, certainly, um, but that's where it would have said exactly. The house in subsequent years was sold. They sold the house in 1909 to a couple named the Gowers and a, eventually was bought by Dr. Baldwin, who was one of the main physicians at Good Samaritan Hospital. And he expanded it. He added a whole other wing onto the house. Uh, and that's why it shows a little bit different in the configuration. But you see that long pier, and you realize how much of the shoreline was filled in to make Flagler Drive. F the, the Lake Worth was so shallow, that's why the docks had to be so long, was to get out to deep enough water to dock your boat. So eventually, they just simply dredged all that out to fill in the land for the roadway. That's why the, the shoreline is so very different today. And this is what it looks like today. Yeah, the whole 19 stories of it, and um, the people at the Ropalo, we've, we've talked to them, and um, we're working on putting a historical marker there to commemorate the Deweys. They've gone ahead and said uh, that they would like that, and the um, city of West Palm Beach has also said that they would like that. Earlier today, I was talking to one of the docents, and he was telling me about um, his grandmother or great-grandmother, I forgot now, that um, was here early on and about the real estate she bought. So Bertie was making money with her writings by now, so she did what a very intelligent and savvy woman would do. She started buying real estate. And this poem here is done, it's, um, the author is called The Everglades Poet, and one, it's a really cutesy little poem talking about the different people who were here at the time. And we found one line in there, and it says, Bird wades into real estate. And she did. Now, so it's some morning in West Palm Beach, and Mrs. Dewey is reading her Tropical Sun, and she comes across an ad, Lands for Sale. And she reads that ad, and it said someone's got 160 acres lying at the foot of, or down at the south end of Lake Worth on the county road. And she's like, okay, and it's being sold by a Mr. Charter. So she's like, well, that looks rather interesting. And it is approximately in that location, that land. You can see that the intracoastal waterway was not yet dug out. That was mostly all just kind of mangrovey marsh that was down there. They had not yet dug the canal. So she bought that 160 acres that Mr. Charters had for sale for $700. Now that doesn't sound like a lot, except that Mr. Charter just three months prior had paid $240. So he was very happy with his profit that he made on that land. So now we have to review one of the common stories that people did know at the time, and that, that was that in 1895, two men came down from Michigan that was um, Major Nathan Boynton and William Linton. You might have heard of Linton Road in Delray Beach. So they came down on a land speculating trip. They were hoping to start a colony of Michiganders. And here we see Major Boynton. So Major Boynton and Linton traveled to the area, and the common held belief was that Major Boynton had bought 500 acres of land and had founded the town of Boynton and so on. Well, parts of that 
were true and parts of that were not exactly accurate, which is what we showed. This is the Boynton Hotel that was on the beach. There, there was a hotel. The hotel first opened in winter of 1898. It was a two-story, lovely wooden structure with a wraparound porch, 50 guest rooms, five guest cottages, a dining room, and a bathhouse. It was cheaper than staying at what the Palm Beach Inn or the Breakers, but um, he only stayed here, Major Boynton, for a couple months a year in the winter. He was a snowbird. He was indeed a snowbird. So being a snowbird, not being a resident, not planning to live on the land, you had to buy land. You couldn't just homestead it like the Deweys did as residents. So this is the timeline for Boynton. 1892, Bertie, she's on the sales record as Bertie uh, Dewey, Bertie S. Dewey, buys the land from Mr. Charter. And 1895 comes along, William Linton says, I have a deal for you. I'm gonna give you $6,000 for your land. So in just less than three years of ownership, what she paid $700 for, he's going to give her $6,000. But Linton had problems. He gave her $100 up front, and an agreement, there really was never any warranty deed that she gave him. They had a contract that he was going to pay her $1,500 a year for four years. But Mr. Linton ran into serious money problems, and uh, he couldn't pay her. So what do you do when you don't pay? You get a foreclosure. In the middle of all this comes Major Boynton and says, oh, I'll buy 40 acres from you, Mr. Linton. But Mr. Linton had no title and no deed to the land. So Boynton starts selling lots that he doesn't own. He gets $50 each. So now we have a huge mess on our hands. And in October, they filed for foreclosure. A couple months later, they came to an agreement that Major Boynton would hand over all the money that he had collected from people so that the Deweys could give people good title to their land and deeds. That didn't happen in uh, uh, Del Rey. And I say Del Rey because the first name of Del Rey was Linton. There was the town of Linton and the town of Boynton. People got so upset with Linton, they yanked his name off the town. That's why we got to Del Rey. They didn't do that in Boynton. The, the Deweys were friends of Major Boynton, uh, and they decided to keep the name. Plus, I, I often think I could be living in Deweyville, uh, or I could be living in Dewey, but part of the problem, and I think uh, Debbie Murray knows this with post offices, to have a Dewey right next to a Del Rey, the post office would have never approved that. They're, they sound much too like. There was no zip codes at that time. Boynton used to get Daytona Beach's mail and vice versa many times. So they kept the name of Boynton and they filed the plat. So this was September 1898. So it was shortly after the Boynton Beach Hotel had opened up. And so Bird Spillman Dewey and Fred Dewey filed the plat. It was 40 acres of the town of Boynton. They named the streets after flora and fauna, and they named a street after themselves. Um, we were at a meeting. Dewey Place, and we were at a meeting um, a month or so ago, and we had people that brought their um, land search records, and they were like, right here, right here, here's the name, Dewey. And um, so that really um, spoke to any of the naysayers in the audience. So they truly filed the plat, and in, uh, they ended up building a house in Boynton that was kind of a weekend home, and they also filed another plat for what was called Dewey Subdivision. These were five acre tracks along the intracoastal. So the idea was you'd buy this five acre track, grow your tomatoes, because that's mostly what they grew in Boynton and especially on the water, and then you could just basically walk back over to your home in town. So you had town living, but you also had your little farm nearby. All that land today, some of it is preserved, it's natural marsh, but most of it has huge condominiums on it. I think if the Deweys were to come back, they would be so absolutely flabbergasted <laughs> as to what's happened on their lands in Boynton. To get down there, you had to have a boat. This photo is from the book, and it, from, it um, depicts Fred Dewey going down what is now the Intracoastal Waterway. Back then it was just the body of water known as Lake Worth, and he's there in his little naphtha launch. If you've ever read and wondered what a naphtha launch looked like, many of the people had that. And he's there with one of their many pets. His name was Foozle. Um, 
in the West Palm Beach Library, the books still exist. We went there and we found several of her books and they're in, she's inscribed them and it says a gift from the author. So after many, many years, it's nice to know that her original books are still here in West Palm Beach. And that brings us to Bruno. Bruno was no small deal. It was published in 1899 by Little and Brown, which was one of the top publishers in the country. In the first year alone, it sold 100,000 copies. So it's pretty easy to find copies of Bruno around. And it really gave Bird Spillman Dewey her name as an author, as an accepted author. It was used as a school reader in a lot of the Eastern schools. It was considered juvenile literature, but uh, it's not what would be considered today as a kid's book, because it actually has words in it, not like a whole bunch of pictures. You actually had to read at that time. It remained in print with Little and Brown more than 20 years, and she published it with another publisher in 1924. Um, it's available, you can, it's in Google Books, you can download it. It's an archive.org, Kindle version, whatever. Uh, you can also buy reprints of it that they sell online, but if you have any kind of computer, you don't have to pay for it. It's a lovely story where her dog Bruno is the main character in that, but it actually, now you know the backstory of the book, so you'll actually read it differently than most other people will read it if you it, decide to read it. And as Janet said, these are her books in the West Palm Beach Library that's still there. A different cover, there was actually about four or five covers that we found for Bruno. This is probably the most common one, but there are other covers, and this is one of the later covers that uh, exists for this particular book. Uh, this is the only known picture of Bruno and her cat, Rebecca. It's not a very good picture. You can't really make his face out very well, but he was a big uh, a setter, water spaniel mix, and uh, was really the love of her life, that, that big dog. I think some people, a couple of the volunteers, said they were in tears reading it at the Historical Society because it's that kind of tearjerker book. This is another sample of more of Mrs. Dewey's letters and works. She corresponded with several famous people, and by using the World Cat Search, we were able to find some of the copies of letters that um, she had a correspondence with Mrs. Woodrow Wilson and some other people, and um, so we've saved copies of all of her works. Yeah, the Woodrow Wilson letter actually came. We did find, so we know that Dewey's had no direct descendants. We did find two nieces, actually three nieces, great, great nieces of Mrs. Dewey's, Two knew of her in Illinois, and they actually had some of her things. When we first found them, we were so excited. We were like, wow, they're going to have all of her records, manuscripts, unpublished. And when we contacted them, there was a house fire in 1948, and it was all gone. The only thing they had was two of her books, three of her letters, and two photographs. That was, the that was what was left in their possession that had been placed in someone else's house, which is why it survived at all. So what actually, what the treasure trove was, we don't know. And that's why it's so important that we have archives. This book would not have happened without the Historical Society of Palm Beach County. I can just flatly say that. Uh, the photographs that we have of Ben Travato and the research material from Judge Hoover and some of her works, that all came from the Historical Society. And I only wish that Mrs. Dewey had had the foresight to leave her things to an archive and not to relatives. So if you have something that's very valuable in your family history, your family can still access it in an archive, but when it gets, you know, someone's like, what is this old junk? Oh, let's put it away, or a fire happens, it's gone. And that's what happened in her case. Now, we haven't really seen a good picture of them together. This picture was found pasted inside a copy of Bruno in one of the used copies that we bought. And the picture was in deplorable condition. The silver is lifting off of the picture. And I tried to scan it and do some things with it. I'm not a photo restorer at all. This is what the photograph looked like. And we didn't have a good copy of it. So I found someone locally who does this kind of work. And this is what he was able to do. Not only do you see them, but out of the darkness, you see their dog. This dog was named Van. And I had seen what is the big bow that's tied around Van's neck. And uh, there was Van sitting in that chair. And we see Mr. Dewey at beginning to be an advanced age. He was in his early 70s. You can see he looks to me rather frail to me. 
Um, and Mrs. Dewey there with her ostrich feather hat, she did not ever wear hats where birds had to be harmed. Only an ostrich feather just gets plucked off the back. I was asked the question more than once. Um, people said, if all this happened, if the Deweys did all this, why, why were they forgotten? And one of the reasons why they were forgotten was because their only child didn't survive till adulthood. And also, Fred became very ill. He had tuberculosis. So in 1910, he had to leave Boynton. There was no hospital here in Palm Beach County. So he went to a hospital in Jacksonville. And then he was admitted to what they call an old soldier's home, they refer to it as an old soldier's home in Tennessee. So that was one of the reasons why they were not remembered here in Palm Beach County. And we can see his, his diagnosis are rather dire. Paralysis agitans is Parkinson's disease. He also had failing eyesight, a failing heart, and an injury to the head, which was one of the reasons they left West Palm Beach. She only calls that the accident in the book, but we realized from this that it was he must have fallen and sustained a very serious head injury. So Mr. Dewey passed away, and of all places, Los Angeles, in the Sawtell Military Hospital. He had spent time in Johnson City, he was transferred to Virginia, and eventually he went out all the way to California. Mrs. Dewey, according to newspaper reports, was with him at the time of his death. Now, Mr. Dewey was 19 years older than she was, so he was quite a bit older. Uh, and he passed away there and is buried in the Los Angeles National Cemetery with the full military uh, gravestone designating his service in the Civil War. So Bertie was a widow, and she moved to Jacksonville, and she took up a new cause. She became the field secretary for the Florida Audubon Society. In her honor, we're donating part of the proceeds from this book, not only to the Historical Society of Palm Beach County, but to the Florida Audubon in her honor. She went around, she traveled, and she gave speeches, much like we're doing, to different groups, to school children, and um, she spoke about birds and not destroying the birds and shooting them just for their feathers. These are two photographs. One book, the one photograph with the cat, we again found pasted inside a book, a, a copy of Bruno. And you could see Mrs. Dewey has become a modern woman. She has bobbed her hair, as women did in the 1920s around that time. The picture, the other picture, is with her and her German shepherd named Fritz. At this time, she had bought a house. She had moved from Sold to Boynton. Her husband had passed away. She was living on Seabreeze Avenue. And again, a house that no longer exists. There was a small wooden cottage there that she lived in on Seabreeze. And we think, I've had some people look at this who know about clothing and said that she has Mary Jane shoes on, and Mary Jane shoes became popular in the early 1920s. This was taken at the home of Mrs. Frederick Guest, who was uh, Amy Guest, who was the daughter of Henry Phipps and his wife, Anna, Anna Childs Phipps. So that was where that house, she was great friends with the Phipps. Uh, they were neighbors. Actually, the Phipps' first house was on the west side. It was not on the east side of the island. So they became good neighbors and good friends for many years. This shows um, where, they, where she lived alone in Jacksonville, and she lived in Home Street. This is a copy from the city directory of Jacksonville. Yeah, we weren't able to find much information. She stopped writing when her husband died. That was pretty obvious. There was no more published works except for that one small article in the Audubon Journal. Uh, and it's a shame, but maybe her inspiration for writing had gone because she really was a storyteller. She didn't make up, she always said, you know, made up stories. Her stories were never made up. They were her life that she lived. And uh, there were some nice vignettes from the judge's work about children who would stop by her house and she would help them with homework. And one man whom she, uh, she gifted a Bible where her name was printed in it uh, because she couldn't read it anymore, the print was too small. So there, there was lovely vignettes that Judge Hoover was able to capture. We could have never done that because those people are all gone. The people that contacted Judge Hoover were at that time in the 1960s and their 60s and 70s, so they have all passed on. So had he not done his research at that time, we would not have had the wonderful character, characterizations we have of Mrs. Dewey. So this is a, an obituary we found, and um, it shows that 
Mrs. Dewey passed away April 1st, 1942. She passed away at the home of a friend. She was 86 years old. And we had, op we had ordered a copy of her death certificate, which had indicated that she had not been interred. So we kind of accepted that. And then when we read her obituary, it said that she had been interred. And it turns out in the same cemetery where her brother was buried. So this shocked us greatly. Um, she had one surviving uh, sibling uh, of a sister who in her will she left nothing to. And her oldest sister, and she said in her will, my one sister who's so much older than me will certainly not survive me. Well, she did. So the woman who was 93 at the time, and so I quickly called the cemetery and I said, do you have a bird Spillman Dewey? And he said, yes, he's buried here. And I said, well, it's not a he. I said, well, gosh, not only do you have a grand nephew of Zachary Taylor in your cemetery, you have a grand niece. So nearby was, uh, as we'll see, she was there, so I quickly said to the woman, I said, would you do me a favor and please take a picture of the headstone? And this was her final wishes too. Uh, so in her wishes, she'd also wished to have a handful of her ashes taken to the Breakers Pier. She wanted to be cremated. Well, when we found out that she had been buried, it is possible they buried her ashes, but the woman at the cemetery said that would have been extremely unusual for the time. So we read her will, and it said in her will she wanted to, the handful be taken to the Breakers Pier. Well, the Breakers Pier actually was destroyed pretty much in the 28 hurricane. It was never rebuilt after being pretty much demolished. So last year on her birthday, and her birthday just passed, which was February 16th, we actually, a year ago, uh, we burned one of her short stories, a copy, not an actual real one, just a copy, uh, in my fire pit, and we took those ashes to the Breakers Beach and we let them out into the surf. So at least symbolically, we could honor her wishes that that be done for her. Then it comes to her gravesite. So I said to the woman, would you, you know, take a picture of her headstone so I can see what it looks like? So she calls me back the next day and she says, I have bad news. I said, what? She said, there is no headstone. I said, she's buried in an unmarked grave? after a famous author had done all these things. So I said, okay, we need to fix that. So we did. We got her a little marker. And on that marker, we had inscribed her, her uh, you know, death and birth years, and the expression, I am home. And home written in capital letters. You see that a lot in her writing, and it is her conception of heaven. It is her way of saying, she says, I am home when I am reunited with my husband, with Bruno, with the cats, we're all living in this happy, what she calls the happy hunting grounds, which is actually um, American, uh, Native American alliteration of heaven as well, is the happy hunting grounds. So she said we will all live there in this blissful paradise of home, and she will put it all in capital letters. So I put on her, or we had put on her marker, I am home. So she rests there in Jacksonville in the um, Green Lawn Cemetery on Beach Road with her brother and baby nearby. So we have this wonderful quote that we would just like to share. This is one of the last things that we know that she wrote, and it was a poem. It was called, O Youth Eternal, and it gives a glimpse into just the enchanting way that she had with words. She writes, in welcoming the fulfillment of maturity, we lose not the garment of youth, we hold fast with loving trust to the joy of living, youth of the year, youth of life, youth of the heart, trinity and happiness, everything gilded by life's sunshine, which is power to love, a happy trust in the angel of destiny, a loving tenderness for all created life. And that is the story of the Deweys in Palm Beach County. And I also have the full copies of her essay here. If you'd like to read the whole essay, it's called uh, uh, O Youth Eternal, if you are interested. She was a, a gifted writer. I've actually talked to several professors where I work at Palm Beach State College, and they've said she truly was a gifted and forgotten Southern writer of the time. And we are, have almost, we're in the end stages. We're just at the publication stage of republishing all of her known works in an anthology because she was a lovely writer. I've actually had to have someone, they're all out of copyright, out of print, so we had people actually retype these works 
that will be available uh, for sale so that her works will go on. These truly were her children in a way, her books, her writings that did survive her. And we're, we're thankful for that and super thankful for the Historical Society. Debbie Murray uh, took my manuscript and took her, her pen and made it so much better, which uh, there's no one else in the world who could have done that, who has that knowledge base. So we dearly thank the Historical Society for that and having the archives that allowed our research to be possible. Ginger, Janet, that's all the time we have. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. books available in the back and they will also be in the back to sign those books. Thank you very much for coming.